The Kansas City Chiefs are inevitable. If they weren't the clear Super Bowl favorites, they definitely are now with the addition of DeAndre Hopkins. Stevie, does DeAndre Hopkins put the Chiefs over the top? Is this their Super Bowl to lose now? Absolutely. That's the way I see it. You know, as the defending champs already, still undefeated in the league right now, and you add a piece like DeAndre Hopkins, yeah, I can only say that they're the top team in the league and they're still the team to beat. Gentlemen, we watched DeAndre Hopkins as a member of the Tennessee Titans against the Buffalo Bills. His stat line, one reception, minus two yards, a lost fumble. I think DeAndre Hopkins putting the Kansas City Chiefs over the top is a dramatic overstatement in that he's washed up, yet I think he'll be very good for Kansas City, but it has nothing to do with DeAndre Hopkins, has everything to do with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes because they could make anybody, save the two of us, Chris. Davis, yeah, you could be a stud. Yeah. Look really good in that offense. And I mean, again, I just don't buy that he's DeAndre Hopkins, the vintage piece anymore, but he's good enough where Mahomes and Reed can make him a viable wide receiver one with Rasheed Rice done for the year. With one stroke of the pen, the Kansas City Chiefs just took themselves back up to the top of the NFL. And I hate to say it because I looked at their weapons, I thought they're not going to be good enough. And Mahomes can't make that magic over and over again consistently. They get D Hop. And now they're right back at the top, unfortunately. Welcome into Broken Table, ahead of week eight in the NFL. I'm Aaron Karolnik. That's Davis Sanchez. That is Chris Hine. That is the man, the myth, the legend, Stevie Johnson. We're talking about the Chiefs, their big acquisition at wide receiver. And fellas, I think we could all agree that even before DeAndre Hopkins became a Kansas City Chiefs player, they were going to be a tough out in the playoffs because they're getting there. They're 6-0. and They're absolutely nasty. How much better does he make them, Stevie? And in which way does he make them better? How does Kansas City utilize his talents best? Well, you just add another savvy veteran. You know, you, you add another piece that, you know, has been through the fire. So that when, when it comes to things like that, that's when it comes to locker room IQ. Um, you know what I'm saying? Understanding situations, being confident in teammates. And I think that's what you add more so than, you know, looking for 150 yards. You may not get that on a consistent basis, but you know how the Kansas City Chiefs play. Like I was talking about with a, with a few friends, whether, whether you leave one minute or 13 seconds on the clock, all you need is one play. And we know DeAndre Hopkins is the guy that can make that one play if needed. Stevie, you saying 13 seconds is just like, that's a, that's a knife to the heart. Just hearing, hearing the 13 <laughs> seconds reference. Uh, I'll say this, like Hopkins this year, obviously, yeah, he's not, he's not what he once was, but the way the Chiefs play this year, where it's not deep ball, it's basically just, it's, it's, it's just finding open holes and zones and just nickel and diming down the field. I think that's what Hopkins game is. Hopkins was never a dude who was going to burn you. He, and even now, you look at the numbers. His separation rate, I think he's 1.65 yards of separation average. That's 38th in the NFL. So he's not really getting a, a wise man named Davis Sanchez once said, you're making contested catches. That tells me you're not getting open. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. is it too far gone? Is he really going to move the needle that much? Yeah, you said I believe it. so. Yeah, go ahead, Stevie. No, uh, yeah, I believe so. I, I want to hear your perspective also. Yeah. But I, I believe he's going to do just like you said, Chris, with the dink and dunk. This is the stage of his career. He's not trying to break people down. He's just trying to find the open spot, and he's savvy and smart enough to find those spots. Yeah, and you talk like his his short area quickness is really what I think is kind of his athletic from an athletic standpoint. What is best about him is his short area quickness. He still got that. That's one thing, Steve. You can attest to this. As you get older, you might not have the long speed you used to have, but your short area is is still there at his age, and with him and Mahomes on the same page. Working that underneath, they have somebody in Xavier Worthy that could yeah, take, take the, the top, top off. off yeah, for sure. I, he's he's a. I hate to say it. I don't know why I can hate <laughs> to say it. It's just because the Chiefs are reloading. Mm -hmm. um, he's a perfect fit. And I think you also have to factor in going from Will Levis and Mason Rudolph to Patrick Mahomes. I picture DeAndre Hopkins like when Andy Dufresne escaped from Shawshank Prison, climbing through the sewers and just raising his hands exactly. to the sky. Exactly. Thank goodness I'm out of here and I'm with a real competent football team. That has to factor in too, right, Stevie? Going from whatever the Tennessee Titans are to we know what the Chiefs are, one of the class organizations in the National Football League. That type of boost to mentality has to be big for Hopkins too. Yeah, it's like new life, you know? And I feel like when you look around the league, those top-tier teams, they all seem to got their second win now that it's, what, six, seven weeks um, into the season. You hear about um, 
the uh, the Baltimore Ravens. The first the first game was tough. The second game was tough, but they kind of kicked it in gear and they hit a, hit a second win. Now their running game is crazy. Lamar Jackson's been playing unbelievable. Um, you hear about um, the Buffalo Bills. They got the second win, adding Amari Cooper. You know, now with the Chiefs, they got their second win after losing running back, a receiver. Um, now they add a, a receiver. You know, everybody seemed to be getting their second win around the league. And um, not to mention, you know, the NFC with the Detroit Lions, you know, looking looking unbelievably talented. So it's just it's great entertainment around the league, and I'm and I'm excited for it. It, it really started to feel like an arms race mm-hmm. where teams are really needing to load up. And now one thing that really worries me about Hopkins, he has been average to below average against man coverage this year, but he still kills zones. And we talk about it all the time. What do the Bills play more than anybody? Zone defense. So from a matchup against the Bills, this seems like he's the guy. Okay, so perfect time now to welcome in Jack Armstrong, noted Bills fan and season ticket holder. Jack, thank yes. you for joining us. Happy to be on with you guys. How's everybody doing? Great now that doing you're here, good. Jack. Yes. As soon as Jack Armstrong joins the call, I mean, everything is perking up in a major way. Jack, fill us in. How are you feeling about the Buffalo Bills to this point in the season? We've been talking a lot about the rest of the AFC, called it an arms race with all the receivers that are being traded, all the top teams around the conference. How are you you feeling about where the Bills stand at this point? Stevie, you coming out of retirement here? Come on now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm looking for an agent actually. So, you know, just hit him up. <laughs> we'll be at one bills drive ready to go. Here we go. Uh, you know what? I, I, I think considering they've had some injuries, uh 25% of their cap is in dead money. Uh so their margin of error is kind of slim. And it'd be five and two right now, and you know, conceivably it could be six and one if they had knocked off the Texans. But I think they were okay. You know, and they got a tough game this week, obviously, at Seattle, which is a brutal place to play. And, uh, you know, going to have to play incredibly well to win. Uh, But I kind of like where they're at right now, considering, you know, they've kind of had to go through some some difficult issues on the defensive end, particularly. And, uh, you know, try to kind of navigate those choppy waters and uh, hope that uh, you get back healthy. And obviously, Yvonne Miller will be back next week. And you hope Matt Milano late in the year and, uh, you know, and, and just kind of ride it out a little bit. But uh, I'm impressed with what I've seen so far. Jack, do you think they need to make another move before the trade deadline to sort of cement their status among, like, the Chiefs and the Ravens? I don't know about another move. I think they got to get better. Uh, to me, I, I you know, I think they've given up a lot of big plays this year. And I think they got to just get a little bit better in terms of tightening the screws a little bit, being more fundamentally sound uh, and just – you know, be a a consistent team. I mean, Stevie, you could probably speak to this better than anybody in terms of just watching them. Uh, I don't think they've found that, that stride, that full stride yet where they're really uh, a consistent, well-oiled machine. I, I, they kind of play in fits and starts. Uh, You know, they'll have a stretch where you're like, Whoa, these guys are really good. And then other times you go, who are these imposters, you know, and, What's the old line? Excellence is a habit, not an act. And you got to get to the point where it's habit. So to me, I think uh, they have a good team. Uh, they have good coaching staff. Uh, now it's about improving in season, which I don't care if it's football or basketball or any sport, um, the better teams get better in season and they grow and they tighten the screws and and improve. So to me, I think that's where it's about is just becoming – more consistent on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and we, we was actually just talking about this, um, like the teams hitting their second stride. And and you like you mentioned, at first the, like the Buffalo Bills came out looking like they was hitting on all, firing on all cylinders, even though we had guys that were somewhat out of position. Now with this Amari Cooper pickup, uh, now guys are going into their natural position and we're see, we're going to see a new team, the the team that that players were supposed to be you know, a Z position at the F position. We have people playing different spots. Adding Amari Cooper will allow us to see a, a, a well machine, a well oil machine uh, team now. And I'm looking forward to that this week against a, a tough Seattle team, which is a great test for this Bills because, like, like we said, like Jack also pointed, we could have been six and one if we would have beat the Houston Texans. But that energy that they came out with, um, they didn't come out with that explosiveness. They didn't have that that extra piece that that we are talking about now. 
And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they do uh, in this situation. Uh, like Chris, like like Chris, you were saying with DeAndre Hopkins and the Chiefs, the dink and dunk. I think we'll see a lot of that now with Mac uh, with Mac Hollins and our tight ends and um and underneath routes from from Keon now that they're in their right position. So we'll see a lot of things, a lot of similarities as the season go on. I'm looking forward to it. I want to I want to say this. And I want to ask Jack this, and this is kind of a when we talk about the Bills. Here's my question: I always have. When they're healthy, and you guys who follow, we guys all follow this team, so everyone has an opinion here. But Jack in particular, when the Bills are healthy, are they to beat Baltimore, to beat Kansas City at the end of the season? They need to play above their heads, or do you think that when they're healthy, you think they're on the same level talent wise as those teams? I don't know if I do, but I'm curious for someone who follows as closely as you do what what you think. Well, I would say, and I mentioned this earlier, when you have 25% of your cap of dead money, you got you got you got challenges. Um, and and my point is your margin of error is slim. So uh you mentioned the Ravens and you mentioned the Chiefs. Uh, do I think uh they can beat both of those teams straight up? Absolutely, if healthy and if everything's clicking. Uh I think their margin of error is probably slimmer than maybe the Ravens and maybe even slimmer than the Chiefs. Cause, and, and I look, and I know the Chiefs have had some injuries in terms of their receivers, uh, but there's that re- residue of winning that the Chiefs have that, you know, you just look and you cut, like they just find that guy, Mahomes figures it out, man. He figures it out. And, and that's not a knock on, on Josh Allen whatsoever or, or Jackson in, in Baltimore. Uh, you know, there's just a level of accomplishment there and expectation that is different in, in big moments. So uh, I don't know if they have to play up, but they got to be r- super healthy. And my point about they got to be the team compared to maybe Kansas City or Baltimore or Houston that gets better more so than those teams during the year. Like I'm talking day to day habits. Like I love this young linebacker, Williams. Uh, I, think he's, I think he's got a chance to be really good. And I've seen significant improvement. And I've also seen some plays that you look at and you go, he's a kid. He doesn't know any better yet. But if, like a guy like that, if you can coach him up and between now and the end of the year, he takes another step, I think he's an impact player. Uh, you know, you look at a guy like Bernard. I love this guy. You know, like they, they got a lot of good young players that now we're getting an opportunity to play and you just got to coach them up every week. And I think by the end of the year, like we're seeing Kansas City's defense, they're already elite. You know, can the Bills get to that point uh, where, you know, they play whatever you call complimentary football. But to answer your question, I, I just watch again. I'm a fan. I'm a basketball guy. I'm in the stands having a cold beer cheering. I'm a fan when I watch the games. I am an ex-coach. Uh, I, I'll just say that I, I think that they got a chance to be at the at the finish line if they keep improving and they stay healthy. Me, me, me and Aaron are trying to figure me and Aaron are trying to figure some out here. We got the coach here. Mm-hmm. Is the coach? If you flipped over, Jack, you flipped over to football. OC or DC? Where you at? What side of the ball are we on? Would I be? Oh man, I think I'd be a special teams coach. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Man, that, hey, that's wild. That's wild, Jack, because you you gave me that energy. <laughs> that, that was the same energy that I felt when I got drafted by Coach Bobby April. He was our special teams coach, and he was he was one of those guys. Hey, look, we ready? We go come run through the wall, and we go have fun doing it. You know, that's that's the same energy I picked up. So that's, that's yeah. A- like I'm not I'm not smart enough to be an offensive coordinator. You know, you like these guys. These guys, you know, they're very cerebral and defensively. You know, it's just it's, it's, it, and the deep and and the defenses today are so damn exotic and. The, you know, they, you know, they show all these different looks. It, it's remarkable. I learn so much every week. It's fascinating to me uh, to watch it. And, you know, I, I was very lucky when I first uh, moved to Western New York, I was the basketball coach at Niagara University. And a good, a good friend of mine was Bill Polian, who was a huge basketball fan. And all his kids came to my basketball camp. So I, I used to go out to training camp and spend time with Bill and, and Marv Levy and those guys and got to know all their coaches and, and just a remarkable group of people. And I've gotten to know uh, Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott a little bit. And, and uh, so I'm a, I, I think football people are so fascinating and so smart 
and so organized, uh, you know, compared to basketball people, like these people could run a Fortune 500 company because you got so many different people that you're managing. Uh, it's like it's like literally mobilizing an army. Jack Armstrong will be back with us a little bit later, but let's get to this week's game. The Bills are in Seattle. They're three point favorites, and everybody talks about just how difficult it is playing in Seattle. Why don't we ask Stevie Johnson his own experiences playing there? Stevie, what is it about playing in Seattle that makes it such a difficult place to play? You know, uh, first of all, let's talk about the team. So the team is is pretty talented. The defense, you know, they're hungry. They 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 playing like a team that's got action at taking a, a conference. Um, the offense with Geno Smith, newfound life, DK Metcalf, um, they're making good connections and they're confident. Um, now, when you talk about the entire city, let's just think about how Bill's Mafia is. When another team come into Buffalo and they feel that aura, that, that culture of, of the Mafia and then just that energy going into the games, that's the same thing that the 12th man have out there in Seattle. So, you know, that's what that's that difference. It's that charge. You kind of got to be there to understand it. And, um, you know, that's that's what makes uh, Seattle pretty special. And that's what's making me interested in this game, because I want to see how our team um, combat that energy that the 12th man brings. I'm intrigued by the defense in this, because I don't know what kind of game we're going to get from the Bills. The Seahawks secondary is banged up. But if you look at the numbers, when Byron Murphy plays, they are allowing, I think, like a full yard less per carry. This guy is a game wrecker on the defensive line. Like I remember when he came out of the draft, it was I was preaching like this is the probably the best three technique tackle we've seen since Aaron Donald, which is like that's high praise. But this guy is that good. So Chesy, like if you're the Bills and you see a banged up secondary, but this guy back in the middle after missing a few weeks, how if you're the Bills, how are you attacking Seattle this week? Yeah, it's you'd like to say obviously open it up, right? That's that's your advantage. Mm-hmm. Let it fly, baby. Let, let it rip. I'm interested to see how you know, obviously how they use Amari and how they use uh, Stevie mentioned it briefly there, um, and I think that we're on the same page here. But I would never put Keon Coleman outside. I slide him inside. I think he's a slot guy. Uh, can I get a, a, a head nod or a, or a, a no if you think differently? Um, Stevie, I think that's an advantage. Yeah, yeah. that's because, definitely an because advantage. Because now you have, I mean, that that's where he works. I think he's excellent in there. So if you can, Amari's a better outside guy because Amari's a powerful vertical down the mm-hmm. field guy. It can be, and Keon is a, a work work the sticks and get going. So I would come out with eleven personnel uh, to your point, so I could get all those guys on the field. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to your point, and and attack a weak secondary in 11 personnel with three receivers and throw the ball around because you're right with that, that Seattle front, if you can't run against them um, or if that's at least the, the path of least resistance yes. is their secondary. Bijan, Bijan still went for a hundred last week on him. Yeah, so like you can run, can yeah. run on yeah, him, but sure. it's just not as easy when Murphy's in versus when Murphy's yeah. out. Yeah. And consider Amari Cooper's debut, four catches, 66 yards, a touchdown was on the field for just 35% of the offensive snaps. His role will increase. And, I mean, considering what we've seen from Seattle defensively and some high-scoring games, too, we should note that the last 10 times the Bills have played the Seahawks, those games have gone over the total. So you could expect a lot of fireworks between these two teams, not to mention Geno Smith is somehow leading the NFL in passing yards. So they've been slinging it. They've been slinging it all year long. And I think you may very well have to see Josh Allen and the Bills offense open it up. And I know in a perfect world for Joe Brady, they're running the ball 40 times, but Against a team like Seattle, that may not be the correct course of action, Stevie. Yeah, well, I think the Buffalo Bills will win by more than three points. And and like Davis was saying, with, with Keon being in the slot, if you look at this team now with this Amari Cooper piece, let Amari Cooper do his thing at the X or wherever he needs to be. Um, and then with Keon at the slot, it's like an extension of a Dawson, a Dawson Knox, a Dalton Kincaid, a Mac Hollins there. You got to think about their height, 6'4", six, 6'5". Um, and they're working that middle drag routes. It's hard to keep up with that and read if it's going to be a run uh, with Ray Davis um, being as patient as he is, you know, finding his holes. And then James Cook coming back. Uh, Shakir, he's healthy, so you can get – he don't have to do too much downfield. He can get those quick passes. Like, the offense is so dynamic. I, like I, like we were speaking on earlier, I just think they got their second win, and we're going to see a, a even more leveled-up Buffalo Bills offense. And that's why I feel like this, uh, this three-point lead would be – it'll be shattered. Also, too, from on the Seattle side, DK Metcalf missed practice Wednesday. It seems like he's going to miss practice today. We're taping this on a Thursday. We'll probably learn more about his status on Friday. But if he's out, 
I don't know. The Bills' defense has really come alive lately. Their pass rush is on fire. And if you look at what the Bills have done in the second half of games defensively, teams aren't scoring on them. Like, teams are moving the ball and getting points in the first half. Look at the, their game logs, and we'll bring up the graphic here. In the second half, it's zero points. It's three points. Their defense, Dave, uh, Davis, you talk about this all the time with Sean McDermott. He, his adjustments, his halftime adjustments have been on point this year more so than ever. Is there anybody who's more underrated than Sean McDermott? Like what? What is it about? What does the rest of the world not see in what he's done with with the personnel that they have over the last five years and the injuries? I mean, he, I heard a, Chris Long had a great line. It made me think of you. Sean McDermott makes what is it? He makes he makes small people big. Like he he coaches up small people to feel big, and that's kind of the vibe we get from the defense this year. I saw I saw another thing. It was about their their draft picks at corner. Uh, whatever year, whatever year that uh, Trey hit, other than Trey getting paid, they haven't had a guy make over three million dollars in at secondary. Corner. Wow! Yes. Oh my God! It was like what the corners are making. Nichols are making five five million dollars yeah. now, and they have not had a guy over three million since Trey, well, which was. Like, we're also seeing it too. Like Trey White is. I looked at the PFF rankings. He's one of the bottom corners in the league. One of the worst corners in the league this year. Jordan Poyer, I think, ranked eighty six out of eighty seven safeties. So. It, 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 McDermott is the is the secret sauce here, especially when it comes to the secondary. Yeah, re reminiscent of of Bill Belichick. You remember how he used to do getting getting undrafted guys from offense to defense and making like y'all said, small guys big. And that's what we see with McDermott. The only thing is they the Buffalo Bills has been running into a guy named Patrick Mahomes, who's dang near revolutionized this quarterback position, how Steph Curry did with the point guard position. So I mean, it, out of respect, you know, you got to show love to McDermott. Um, I think the Buff I think the Buffalo Bills and hit under his coaching would have had championships if they didn't run into this generational talent um, in Mahomes. But you know, with the team that they're building now, I really feel confident and strong that if they just continue to elevate, um, like you guys spoke on the pass rush, I like to give a shout out to Dwayne Carter because I feel like he's gonna he brings that energy, that young energy that that the team need. And then when they are all healthy. It's just going to be explosive, and we'll see what happens when that AFC match come up against either the Ravens or um, the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, it's time to hit the streets. You hit the streets. You talk to the people, Chris. I love it. A same game parlay <laughs> by it. the people ahead of the Bengals and the Philadelphia Eagles. I'll say this, Chezzy. Every week when I post it to my socials, Chezzy's the so first good. one to so respond. Good. So That's I... Right. Maybe, maybe one day we'll see you on those streets yeah. and I'll just we launch should. a football at you. You should. Only in the beaches. If you start doing this, the streeters in the beaches, you'll see Davis Sanchez. I just tried. Oh, Match. oh yeah. Look at that adjustment on the fly. See that snag? We are on the streets of Toronto doing a little same game parlay for Eagles and Bengals. Let's see who the streets like this week. Bike guy, you a football fan? Second bike guy, football fan? Uh, maybe, yeah, we got a maybe. Who's your team, first of all? JC. You're a Chiefs fan. But Who I hurt you? Like, why? Why are you the way that you are? I, I became a Chiefs fan when uh, Joe Montana moved. Uh, Back in, like, the 90s? In the 90s, yeah. Fair. So you were there before they were affiliated with the refs? Ex yes, exactly. Okay, <laughs> now, let's make a little same game parlay with FanDuel. This okay. is Eagles-Bengals. So who do you like in the game? Uh, Eagles. Okay, now, do you see anything on here you like? We got touchdown scores, we got pass yards, rush yards. Do you see anything that jumps out? Who do you like? Saquon, you got A.J. Brown, a lot of options. A.J. Brown, let's go. Okay, so we got an A.J. Brown touchdown, Eagles win, and then let's go Let's go with Burrow. Burrow pass yards, 257 and a half. Decent number, over or under? Let's go under. Okay, so we got Burrow under, A.J. Brown touchdown, Eagles to win. Thank you very much, and I hope nothing but bad things happen to the Kansas City Chiefs. I doubt it. <laughs> go undefeated this year. <laughs> November 17th against the Bills says otherwise. I doubt it. I am, yes. Wide, exactly. wide right. Oh. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. Bike guy, you want to make a catch while riding the bike? No? No? You got this. Come on, you can do it. You said you are going to the Bengals game this weekend. I did, yeah. Are you a Bengals fan? I am, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. okay so let's make a little same game parlay yeah. with Eagles and Bengals. Start with the game. Who do you like? You like Cincy or you like Philly? I have to go Cincy since I'm going. Oh, do you want Chase Brown and Burrow both over yards? Yes. Okay, and then who's getting a touchdown? T. What? Higgins, T. Higgins. So we got T. Higgins getting a touchdown. Correct, yeah. Chase Brown yards over. Burrow yards over. Bengals to win. Yeah. What's the tailgate like? What's what's your tailgate vibe going to be like at the game? Uh, my tailgate will be non-existent. Enjoy but the game. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Thank Good you. Time. Okay, we're going to take a little detour, add a little more beef to the table, as uh, these. this is 
AJ and Chris from Wingnuts, anyone who's been to Western New York knows you guys have the best wings, be best wings in Buffalo, best wings in Western New York, hands down. Chezzy and Krolnick are enjoying some of those wings right now off, off camera, so we're going to talk. Um, we'll get into your story in a bit, but one thing I've always wondered is, is there a correlation between how the bills are doing and wing sales? Absolutely, 100%. The Buffalo Bills drive the Western New York economy. When the Bills win, sales are up, people are drinking, people are spending money, people are happy to go out and be with their families. When the Bills lose, we don't see anybody until Wednesday, maybe Thursday. It's kind of a, a ghost town. It's pretty, pretty funny how a football team can literally drive the economy of an entire city. Well, honestly, I thought, and I'm, I've been a Bills fan my whole life, I will always kind of they lose. I don't talk to my family. I'm quiet. I, don't, I guess I'm not purchasing anything either. But and we saw with the chart there, like the sales are almost double after a win. I guess people are celebrating. People just like, hey, you know what? Bills won. Let's party. Let's go. Let's get some wins. Keep the ball rolling. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's wild. People kind of sulk a little bit. You know, they they don't want to spend money. They want to tuck away indoors. It's getting a little cold now. But when they're winning, people are spending. Absolutely. But I, I, why not sulk with some chicken wings, though? <laughs> it's funny, but I don't I'm the same as you. I don't I don't listen to sports radio the yeah. next morning. I don't turn on ESPN or NFL Network. I just keep it moving and just get into my week and go right head down, focused into work. For sure. Now, you said it before, the, the bills sort of drive the Western New York economy. And looking, we got a little pie chart here of days of the week and when you're selling stuff now, like. So basically, it seems Monday Monday through Thursday, you're selling about 16,000 wings total. And then Sunday, you could be selling 12,000 wings just in that one day? Yeah. I mean, it's it's wild. Uh, basically, if there's a home game, and especially if UB is also playing at mm -hmm. home, it's we're there's a wait from, you know, 1130 in the morning on Saturday until 11 o'clock at night. You know, it's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's insane. Friday, too. And then Sunday, especially if the Bills win, we'll have like a really busy morning from 11 till 1. It'll die down, and then all of a sudden, if we win around five o'clock, it'll go from empty to completely full on a thirty-minute wait in the snap of a thumb. Yeah, Amazing. dinner rush. It's crazy. Now, your guys' claim to fame—at least how I sort of saw the story of Ed and everything that kind of happened—was on pardon my take. So, take us back. That interview happens, and then the next day, all chaos ensues. So, Ed and Alicia Razin, the founders and our partners. Um, Basically, they were looking for a way to make these crazy chicken wings. They had a couple of different spots. They were leasing a kitchen at a spot for a while. They started to blow up. Then they opened their own spot over at the Knights of Columbus. Um, we met with Ed and Alicia. You know, we, we convinced them that we had the team. We had the vision, uh, you know, the financial support to be able to carry their dream, you know, forward. And they were as blessed as you could ever be. They mm -hmm. were the happiest. You know, you could see somebody. And now to see them like come into the restaurant and see where it is now compared to where it was, mm -hmm. it's just it's unbelievable. So now we were talking, we were talking off air before. What's it like when you see you see a truck come in and you're told, hey, that I think that's Josh Allen coming to get some wings. All of a sudden we're standing there and I'm I look over and sure enough, there's Josh Allen standing at the counter. So you know, you gotta act, try not to act like a fan. When, how can you how can you not? You know, like so I walked in the cooler, I regained my composure, took a couple <laughs> deep breaths, and then I walked out like I had done this a million times before. I'm like, hey, Josh Allen, what's going on, man? So, you know, I got him to try one hot and crispy right out of the fryer. I saw it drip. I heard it crunch. Oh, a nice. Smile on his face. And uh, we, he, you know, that's when everybody started to realize that's Josh Allen. Yeah. So people started to flood him and ask for pictures. And he's like, hey, you mind bringing these out to the car for me? I'm mm -hmm. like, no problem. So brought him out to the car. And that was our, our Josh Allen experience. Well, it was then let's, exciting. let's transition then because that's a perfect segue. We're going to do, obviously, FanDuel, our lovely sponsors. So let's do a little over under. So we're going to take Bill's players. Josh Allen comes into wing nuts. What's the total number of wings Josh Allen's eaten? I would say probably about 15. Yeah. That's a big guy. Like, that's a low number though. I know they're the wings big are big. Wings. I know they're, they're big, big wings. wings but they're yeah. big wings. I think he'd probably take down 20 if he really pushed it. Okay. So let's go, let's go to some of the, some of the linemen then. What about Deion Dawkins? Deion Dawkins comes in. Well, how many wings is he crushing? 30. Yeah? Yeah, I'd say over under 30. Okay. And then what about Ed Oliver? He's he's a lineman, but he's a little more he's a he's a he's a little more fit in terms of the defensive lineman. I think I could put some food. Yeah, down. I'd say twenty-five. Yeah. Especially after he's on that horse, you know, oh. ride the horse over, yeah. get get going. For sure. 
Okay, then let's finish with me. If I'm if I'm in wing nuts, how many wings am I eating? You look like a thirty plus kind of I guy. Have, yeah. Yeah, like, I'm gonna, I feel like you might be able to put a few a few down. <laughs> that I once did seventy three wings, but that was I was in my twenties. That it's was about fifteen though. years ago, yeah. and they were about half the size of yours. So if sure. I can do seventy three of those, then maybe I can do thirty thirty five years. I think a thirty is a safe safe over under. Okay, sure. so we're gonna have to make that happen you next time I'm in happen. town. I'm gonna pop by, guys. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much for joining my us. Hey, really thanks appreciate for it. Us. Awesome for sure. Thanks, Chris. Okay, time now for our newest segment. We're, this is Tales from the Tailgate. Boys, you're back on the desk. Mm -hmm. The Wingnuts guys took care of you. I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping when we're done that there's a little, you left me some chicken wings no, there. Not nothing. likely. Not likely. <laughs> nothing. Okay. It's all gone. Back. Only bones. <laughs> <laughs> good, good to know. Uh, okay, so this segment, we're just going to look at some of the chaos. Everyone knows Belva's Mafia is the most insane fan base. Let's start with this guy who last week... Tried to bring a pumpkin into the stadium and brought a pumpkin into the stadium. Stevie, what do you what do you think of when you see this video? Hey, first off, he swagged out. I, I like the sauce that he got. The the Bills vest, the the two two six jersey. Shout out Ashley Bodie. And he in a holiday spirit. So I, I'm for it. I'm I'm all for it. I think the most surprising part of that video was how the security guards had no reaction to the pumpkin. Yeah, right? just like, this it is looked normal. like it was like someone's wallet or cell phone. There's a pumpkin going through the scanner and they didn't even blink. But I'm <laughs> I'm in favor of it as well. I mean, Halloween's in the air. We're getting close to one of my favorite holidays. Kudos to that individual for really feeling the holiday spirit. I mean, you got to have some swag to come mm -hmm. through with a pumpkin and a, and a jean vest. Right. Uh, he's right. Doing it. Okay, next up, we got this fan. It was a hot day Sunday, and this guy is pulling out room temperature slash overheated salmon from his back pocket that he was sitting on mm. all game. Nothing wrong with a little bagel and lox when it's fresh, but Delicious. Steve, you see, you see that salmon. What are you, what are you thinking? A hot salmon skin right off the buns. Oh, oh I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, that's a hard pass for me as well. I mean, listen, you got to get your protein in these days, but. Preferably it's something a, that is a little bit more the fresh. Processor. I don't know. Yeah, I I don't get it. Even if even if it. I'm sitting near that guy, I might move. Yeah, you also you know you know you're you're in an office environment, which the going to a Bills game is not. You can't be bringing in salmon. Imagine no, you, no fish you show up to yeah. Kia's eating salmon on the no, panel. No like what fish. would what was your reaction? Yeah, no, to that? No, no, right, no, we can't even smell it though, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> you can kind of smell the video a little bit, which you wouldn't think would be possible, but I feel like I can. It's a it's a bad feeling. I'd rather not. All right, let's bring Jack back in here. Jack, we're just talking some tailgate stuff. I've been to your tailgate. You, you do, you're a fantastic host. You're, you're like anywhere. I remember when we golfed in Lewiston this summer. You're basically the mayor of Lewiston, and that's how it is at your tailgate. But what makes a Jack Armstrong tailgate so great? Wow. Uh well, first of all, I always start off with like a Bloody Mary, kind of, <laughs> kind of get settled into the day. Party going. And, and then I downshift and have a few cold beers. I drive to the game, but my wife drives home. <laughs> or I'll drive to the game. Somebody else is driving home. I'm, it's my day off. I'm a fan that day. So I'm just a football fan. Uh, so, I, you know, I love getting there. The game's at 1 o'clock. I'm at my tailgate, 8.45, 9 o'clock that morning. And then after we eat, I always have my pregame cigar. Uh, and I get my red solo cup and I walk into the stadium with my cigar, my solo cup, and uh, I'm getting ready to go. I'm not jumping through no tables. <laughs> I don't roll like that. I'm too old. I got to work the next day. I just enjoy it. I love it. I get ticked off when my Raptor schedule comes out and I can't go to the Bills game. That's Hambone's fault. We know that's Hambone's fault, Jack. Now, I think you were speaking Stevie's language there when you were saying you had the cigar going. I know, Stevie, you had your tailgate last week, and there was a there was the cigar presence was there. I saw pictures of you and Sal Capaccio smoking the stogies. So it seems like you and Jack got a little, yeah. little tailgate vibe going on here. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to send you some of our Cigar Mafia Sweet Victory Cigars, brother. So <laughs> oh. make, sure you, make sure you get a special pack. No, but it's it's great. I I, I uh, but look. I tell you what. And Chris has met my wife. Uh, she, you know, she grew up in Western New York. She is a crazy Bills fan. She's been a season ticket holder since she was a kid. And uh, you know, honestly, I got into the Bills because of her. I'm from New York City. Jack, as entertaining as you are, your wife might be more entertaining at the tailgate than you are. She's she's a riot at those wow. games. 
Well, I'll tell you what, you can't put her on this show because she has no filter. <laughs> and uh, she would start, she'd be talking smack uh, a little too much. I, 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 She wants to do a podcast with me. And I'm like, honey, I like my job. I don't need to go on a podcast with you because she has Ooh, zero filter. Ooh, so. Ooh, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. You're the best, Jack. Thank you. You got yeah, well, it, guys. Love, Have Jack. a great day. Take her easy, Peace, Jack. <laughs> Peace out. Thank you to Jack Armstrong, the coach. Thank you as well to the guys from Wingnuts. And really, our audience should be thanking us because we nailed our staff same game parlay last week. Shout out to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Took took the week seven, but we got that. counting? Who's counting? A lot of dubs. What are we thinking this week, Chris? First of all, I'll say, yeah, the parlay took some time to hit. But if you look at these standings, we're giving you winners pretty much week in, week out. Um, That's what we do. And for mine, I am going to go with Joe Burrow, over one and a half touchdown passes this week. Burrow's been slinging. I think he has that in five or seven games this year. And if you look at Philly, they're, I think, averaging 1.3 or 1.4 touchdown passes allowed per game. But when they play against a good quarterback, they are, they're, Jordan Love's torched them. Baker Mayfield torched them. They're giving up touchdown passes when they're going up against a good QB. And I think Burrow hits that number, no problem. For me, I'm taking the Cleveland Browns over 16 and a half points on their team total. This is a team that has been under this is, yeah, their every, team total every, every single week. But there is one differentiator this week. Deshaun Watson is gone. Jameis Winston is in. And then that's going to represent a seismic shift in the way the Cleveland Browns approach their offense. I think they're going to feel confident throwing the ball down the field as opposed to feeling terrible about their offense, watching Deshaun Watson do whatever Deshaun Watson was doing prior to his unfortunate injury. The Browns turn their season around this week. Now, they still get killed by Baltimore, but they go over 16 and a half on their team total. I'm looking at this Bills game. I got Josh Allen over completions. Now, here's Mm. why. It's, It's a take that Seattle fan base. Stevie, you talked about it. I've played there. It's loud. It's crazy. In order to slow a team down, you go up-tempo early, get the ball out. Also, adding adding Amari and I think playing some 11, a lot of 11 personnel, try to spread them out, get the ball out quick to your playmakers. I think Josh has not a bunch of long completions, but a lot of quick, short completions. I got Josh Allen over. You saw, I'm fading. I'm definitely not, sorry, not fading. I'm, I'm hopping on that. Like, yes. Get the rabbit emoji. I like that. I like your logic there. Uh, Stevie, you're, you'll close this out. What's the final leg of this parlay? Okay, yeah, so I was initially going to go with the Chiefs heading to Vegas and dominating the Raiders. But you know what? I like this Bills-Seattle matchup, so I'm going to run over there and I'm going to select the Buffalo Bills. I'm going with Bills over Seattle, and it's going to be by more than three points. And, um, yeah, we're we going to see a, a evolved Buffalo Bills team. I'm excited for it. So now we're technically – we're an SGP plus now. The people yes. of FanDuel, they love their SGP Ooh. pluses. So. Diversification. Yes. Let's go. That's it for us this week here on Broken Table for Aaron Corona, Chris Hine, Davis Sanchez, Stevie Johnson. We'll be back next week. Stevie, you know how to close this baby out. Make sure y'all remember to handle business, have fun, and repeat. One love.